Uh, well, thanks, Nikki, for uh, inviting me. And uh, I, 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 it's funny, I actually have come down with a cold for the first time in a year. I, one of the one of the good things about COVID is I, I haven't been sick. I, I mean, it's we're all we're all wearing masks all the time. So actually, uh, the number of people that have caught colds or even the flu or anything like that is just dramatically lower. The the insane arguments that these people have here in, in America, the, the Republicans about not wearing masks because it takes away your freedom, and not believing that masks have anything to do with not spreading COVID is like why do you think doctors have a mask when they're operating on you? You think it's a political decision? It just the whole thing defies any logic. Anyway, uh, so for some reason, uh, I've been inoculated. So you know, fortunately, having had my shots, my second shot over six weeks ago, um, I you know, my first thought if I came down with a cold is, oh my god, is this it? Uh, but instead, it's just simply a head cold. So I apologize if I seem a little uh, congested. Um, I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. Uh, give me one second. I'm just going to fire up. I just figured it'd be more interesting for everybody if I showed some photographs. Um, so let me do that. Let's see here. Let's see if this works. And I'm never quite sure exactly how to do this the right way, but let's try it. So I'm going to, let's see, share screen. Uh, I think that's the one I'm gonna share. Tell me if you guys are seeing this. Yep. So what do you see on the screen? Uh, some Canadian Mounties and what looks like a Zeppelin. <laughs> okay, and did, did this just change to another slide? It has, it's changed to uh, a younger looking version of a photographer. <laughs> okay. Cannot be related. Okay, I, I, okay, I'll go back. So um, I, uh, I was painfully shy as a kid and um, uh, I always felt like everybody in the world when they were born were given some kind of toolkit that taught them how to relate to other people. And it was just left out of my toolkit. So I would always watch other people all the time. And I thought if I just kind of quietly watch other people and how they related to each other, I would somehow pick up the ability to talk to other people. And when I was 16, my father gave me a camera and it suddenly was my rabbit's foot. It was my way of walking up, especially to girls. You know, being 16, being shy was very painful. <clears throat> Um, and, uh, uh, and so uh, having a camera gave me this ability to insert myself into the, basically it, 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 I found that most people like being photographed. So um, I had this weird theory. It, 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 I didn't actually believe this, but I had this, my rationalization for being shy and not being able to really easily relate or connect with other people was that I was actually an alien sent here to observe life on earth. And I wasn't supposed to interact with the population. I was just supposed to quietly observe. And um, um, in fact, I remember as a child going to the playground by myself at night and, and, and wishing they would come and get me and take me back to the planet I'd come from just so, because I was really painfully lonely. And uh, I went to college. Uh, my dad was adamant that I not be a photographer. I mean, uh, it's all I wanted to be since he gave me this camera at 16 but he wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer or something where he could actually earn a living. So he would not let me go to any university with a photography program. However, within a week of starting college, I, I went to the art department and they let me create my own photography major. So within a week, I was doing what I wanted to do anyway. Uh, when I graduated from college, I saw an ad in the newspaper. I did the yearbook and the newspaper. And it was always like if not, if anything I could, any excuse I had to take photographs was a good excuse. So my very first assignment, ironically, was for the National Enquirer. It was a very sleazy sort of tabloid newspaper here in the United States. You know, Elvis is living on the back of Mars. You know, aliens uh, are actually controlling, uh, you know, Donald Trump, whatever, just silliness. And my first assignment was to photograph two policemen. These are real policemen who claim they saw flying saucer land outside of Philadelphia. And um, uh, it was my first professional assignment. I got fired because I couldn't stop laughing at these guys. It was so obvious they made the story up. They were when they were telling me the story, they were contradicting each other. I love the guy with the chin strap on the right. Looks like he bought his house, his hat in a uh, like a, a used store. These are actually real policemen, but the whole thing was so Mickey Mouse, and I I I did not treat them with the dignity and respect that somehow they thought they deserved. So uh, the person that hired me the gym, at the uh, inquirer fired me. Um, I was very lucky that I, uh, uh, my art professor knew someone at Time Magazine 
So I went up there with my yearbook. I never studied photography at all. I was really self-taught. Um, and I, every time I got an assignment from a magazine, these are all cover stories that I shot. Um, I would go from, this is so cool. I got an assignment for Time Magazine to, oh shit, they're gonna find out I'm a complete imposter. I have no idea what I'm doing and this will be the end of my career. And every single assignment was this high of, this is great to, oh shit, this is where I'm gonna screw it up and I'm gonna, my, my life will be over. Um, I realized at some point that the, when I wasn't scared is when I screwed up. Uh, the adrenaline was actually the thing that kind of drove me. And uh, this picture was actually taken by the prime minister of Australia in Japan. Uh, one of my assignments was to uh, spend a week traveling with him. Um, I look like this. I was this sort of long haired hippie kid. I was 26 years old. And uh, we were, uh, the, we toured the Nikon factory uh, with the prime minister of Australia. There are about 20 Australian journalists and uh, we all got on the bullet train to go from Tokyo to Kyoto. And there was a press car in the back of the train. And the Secret Service people came back to the press car and said, where's the American kid? And I was always about 10 years younger than everybody else. You know, all the journalists were you know, wearing suits and ties. They were all very professional. And I was always looking like this. Um, and you know, jeans and sneakers and disheveled hair. And, and so the Secret Service people are now escorting me to the front of the train. And all the Australian journalists said, oh, you're in trouble now, mate. When the Secret Service comes and gets you, you really screwed up. So they take me to the front of the train. They put me in this little uh, cabin with the prime minister. And I'm, I'm so nervous. I have no idea what's going on or why he summoned me. And we sit down and he, and he looks at me and goes, so do you prefer the 35 millimeter Nikkor or the 24 millimeter? You know, we had toured the, the Nikon factory that morning. And it turned out he was this avid amateur photographer. And... Uh, he just wanted to talk shop, uh, which, and I was the only uh, person using Nikon, everybody else was using Canon. So he said, have you ever been to Australia? And I said, no, my God, I, I've read about it. I've seen pictures. I, I, it sounds like such a fascinating country. And he said, you know, we have a program where every year we invite six journalists from around the world. Uh, the government pays for it. We fly you down there. You tour the whole country. We just, you know, we feel kind of, you know, we feel kind of isolated at the bottom of the world. And we sort of, we're trying to sort of raise our visibility. Would you like to come to Australia? So suddenly I went from this like one week assignment in Japan to then flying to Australia. Um, <clears throat> once I got there, Time Magazine called and, and they were thrilled, you know, for a magazine to have a journalist develop a relationship with a politician is a dream. So um, when I got to Australia, I told Time, you know, I'm here, would you like me to shoot anything while I'm here? And they said, well, uh, we'd like you to shoot a story about Aborigines. And uh, the Australian government treated the Aborigines very much the way that the American government treated Native Americans. Uh, they, uh, they massacred a lot of them. They put them in, in basically internment camps. Uh, and it was just really tragic, the, the way that these people were treated. And so I did this story and uh, I showed up in Australia and I, uh, there was a social worker I was told to contact was going to take me into all the Aboriginal camps. And um, I was supposed to meet her down the street. She had the, the, the instruction she gave me was when you check into the hotel, you know, uh, leave your stuff in your room, grab your cameras, make, go out of the hotel, make a right, and I'll meet you at this pub. Well, I, I had no sense of direction. And so I made a left instead of a right. And the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life was washing the windows of my hotel. And I took a picture of her. And she started screaming at me to put my goddamn cameras down. And uh, I went over to apologize because very early on in my career, one of my older photographer friends said, if anybody ever gets upset when you take a picture of them, always go over and tell them what you're doing because usually people think you're making fun of them. But I couldn't calm this woman down. She's, uh, I, you know, I apologize. I said, look, I'm a journalist. I'm here. She said, oh, you're here to photograph Aborigines. I said, yeah. Um, she said, you know, you goddamn parasites come here every week. You take advantage of these poor people. You, you, you're paid all this money and you, you know, I said, I'm actually here to try to tell the story of what your government's done to these people. And she said, yeah, I've heard this bullshit before. Get the hell out of here. So I, I left. Um, I um, worked with a social worker all day. <clears throat> Excuse me. And at the end of the day, the woman I, that I was working with, the social worker said, you know, what are you doing for dinner tonight? I said, I'm going to go back to my hotel room and work on captions. And she said, well, a group of us that work with Aborigines are getting together for dinner and you might want to come and meet other people involved in the Aboriginal rights movement. They might give you some ideas of things you might want to photograph while you're here in Alice Springs. 
So I went to this abandoned looking building on the outside of town where she, I thought these were the directions she gave me. And I knocked on the door and of course she opened the door, but the woman who had been washing the windows of my hotel who was not happy to see me. And when I looked in the back of her house, uh, it turned out she had four camels tied up. And I said, why do you have camels? And she said, it's none of your business. So I went to the woman that had been working for me and said, you know, what's with your friend? I, I took a picture of her, but she acts like I killed her dog. She said, oh, Robin's a strange girl that showed up here about a year ago. She lives in this abandoned house. We bring her food and music. And uh, <clears throat> she's very involved in Aboriginal uh, you know, uh, rights. And uh, she's got this crazy idea that she's going to walk 2,000 miles alone with four camels and a dog through the outback of Australia. I said, why? And she said, we don't know. We're afraid she's going to die out there. We told her we want to go with her to protect her, to be with her. And she won't, won't let anybody come with her. And uh, uh, she, you know, she's been trained, learning how to train these camels. And I said, wow, that's totally nuts. So I never thought about it again. I worked all during the week. And the last day when I was leaving, uh, the woman working for me said, you remember the girl with the camels? I said, yeah, a little hard to forget. She said, well, she wants to ask you a favor. I was trying to think what possible favor could she ask me? She wants a copy of my pictures or something. She said, Robin wrote to National Geographic a year ago and asked if they would fund her trip and they never answered. And she thought maybe you know somebody there, could she use your name? I said, you know, I've been to some workshops. I'm, I'm still just getting started in my career. I mean, she can use my name. I don't know if it would really help or not. So I go back to New York and a week later, the phone rings and it's the editor of National Geographic saying, that they got a letter from this woman uh, about this trip she's going to do. And, you know, is she for real? Is she going to die out there? And, you know, they don't want the, the headline, you know, National Geographic Explorer dies in week two. So I was trying to be polite. I said, well, she's very intense. She's very focused. I've seen her camels. I've seen her maps. And they said, well, since you guys are such good friends, would you like to be the photographer that we hire to photograph her trip? And you're going to have to fly out into the outback five times over the next few months, over the year that she's out there. To, and you're gonna have to find her, like you're kind of an outback guy, right? You've done Outward Bound, you're you're like a you know a trekker. And like, I wasn't even a Boy Scout. I couldn't even change the tire on my car, but I said, oh yes, of course, I'm, I'm totally there. So uh, the next thing I knew, um, I'm on this unbelievable journey with this woman who hates me. She did not want her friends there, let alone me. And so uh, I, of course, fell madly in love with her because she hated me. Uh, most interesting human being I ever met. Uh, just very complicated, very intense, very intelligent, uh, constantly probing you and making you think. I won't go into all the stories, but um, once I showed up out there and uh, she was always, in my mind, insulting me, but she would say things like, you Americans treat friendship like Valium. I said, okay, what is that supposed to mean? She says, well, every time I see Americans together, they're all saying, don't worry, it'll be fine. Everything will work out. I said, that's a bad thing. And she says, yeah, because in Australia, if someone's your friend and you care about them, they're doing something stupid. They're marrying the wrong person. They're doing drugs. They're, you know, whatever they're doing, you, you hit them over the head with a stick. Like you risk your friendship to actually be a friend. You confront them. You don't let them, you don't let them like make the wrong decisions. And you may lose your friendship, but at least you're honest with your friends. You guys all coddle each other all the time. Uh, you know, it was one of those things where it was real. I never thought about that. You know, in, in a way, she was right. I mean, it's a, I don't know if it's American, but um, so every conversation I had with this woman was like this. And I, I ended up spending three months traveling with her. And um, it was sort of my year of growing up. I mean, I was 26 years old, I think 27 by the time the trip actually started. But emotionally, I was like 19 years old. I mean, every girlfriend I had lasted a week. And then I get an assignment and I'd leave. And so every time, anything was remotely complicated. It's like, you know, we'll work this out when I come back and I would never come back. I'd fly off to the next country. I'd lived in hotels 11 months of the year. But with Robin, first of all, I had to keep coming back and she wouldn't let me get away with anything. And, and it was it was absolutely fascinating. Um, she got lost. She was attacked by herds of wild camels. She ran out of water. Um, I kept telling her to keep a journal. I said, somebody gonna wanna write a book about this. And she said, why do you have to turn everything into a product? Why can't you experience things and not be marketing it, packaging it, and trying to sell it? Like, you know, you're always thinking about selling something. I said, okay, I'm just saying. So after her trip was over, um, her, she was on the cover of probably 50 magazines around the world. Um, two years later, she wrote a book. Um, and I, I said, 
do you want my, I've been taking, you know, journal notes. And she said, no. And in the book, she said, I want you to read the book before it comes out because I'm not very nice to you in it. So in the book, I'm a complete asshole from New York. And then as the book goes on, I get better. So she said, do you want me to change anything? I said, no, I think people will uh, see it through the through through your eyes. I think they'll understand the perspective. Um, four years ago, um, for, for many years, Hollywood tried to make this into a movie. Uh, first, it was going to be, uh, let's see, first it was, uh, it was Julia Roberts trying to buy the rights to it. Then it was uh, Helen Hunt, then it was Nicole Kidman. So every three or four years, I get a call from somebody in Hollywood saying, we're doing a movie uh, about Robin's Camel trip. Can you be a consultant? And my friend who's an entertainment lawyer said, they don't want you to be a consultant. If you look in the mouse print in the back of the boilerplate, somewhere in there, it will say, you hereby grant us the rights to portray you throughout the universe, blah, 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 blah. And you know, they were, he, my friend was right. Every single time Hollywood called, all they wanted me to do is sign my rights away. I didn't really care. So four years ago, I got a call from some guy in Australia saying, we're going to do the movie. And I said, you know what? I've had this conversation now for you know 25 years and I'm not really interested. He said, no, no, we, we've cast the actors. We're shooting in, in six weeks. We want to fly you to Australia to be on the set. So on the left is the real Robin. And on the right is the actress who played her in the movie. And the guy that they ended up hiring to play me is Adam Driver, who's uh, Kylo Ren in Star Wars. Um, it was it, it was beyond surreal, as you can probably imagine, to be on, on this set. They actually used my photographs to build the sets. So here are pictures I shot when I was 26, 27 years old. And now I'm watching these actors literally wearing, they, when I was taking, I took both of these pictures. And when I was taking the picture of Mia on the right, you know, I haven't looked at my pictures for many years. And I said, are you wearing the same blouse that Robin wore during the trip? And she said, oh, yeah, they looked at your photographs and they actually manufactured the clothes to, I said, why? Who would care? Who would ever know it wasn't the same clothes? Uh, I love sometimes the obsession of people in Hollywood. You know, James Cameron, when he did uh, Titanic, actually got the measurements of the, the banisters um, of the, the room leading into the, the ballroom on the Titanic and had them build the exact same to the same dimensions of the banisters. Like, why? Who would care? Um, so there's Robin and me on the left. There's Adam and Mia on the right. And the movie won a lot of awards. It's on, uh, I don't know if you guys have Amazon Prime or Netflix in your country, but it's been one of the top indie movies the last couple of years.